yeah, I think um, I think there's a bit of a cultural shift going on in universities in this country anyway. Um, and I think the universities that are going to be successful in the future are the ones that really take the time to get to know their students and look after them. Um, we see big shifts in sort of the mental health of um, sort of the country and sort of general populations in general and especially with sort of covid and lockdown i think um i think we're going to see a big shift towards that style of tutoring to be honest and i think it's a good shift Hi, welcome to Unapologetically You with myself, Tuls and Keddie. We are so pleased to welcome Matt Caldery. Matt is such a passionate and caring lecturer. He's a tutor and a program manager in sports coaching. And Matt is constantly nominated for student-led awards in the more supportive tutor and inspiring lecturer categories. Matt is also active grassroots sports coach and a teacher trainer where he works with a range of organizations to help health outcomes of individuals within public and private sector organizations. Matt's philosophy centers around others' health and happiness. He also aligns his values, beliefs, and morals to underpin everything he pursues. Matt and I started chatting via Twitter and I invited him on as a guest to discuss relevant topics such as trolling, controversial subjects such as stereotyping and also to get his experience into grassroots coaching welcome Matt thank you so much for taking time to chat with Kelly and myself welcome yeah. Matt <laughs> thanks for having what me a, <laughs> what a guy that bio was excellent yeah it's, yeah I feel like I've oversold myself now so no, no, no hopefully it goes no, well that's, <laughs> that's just us doing that. research on you digging digging about you and it was really good and interesting to figure out of there's so many layers to people anyway, isn't it, that we find interesting? But when we know, mm -hmm. right, they're coaches or the lecturers and it's like, it's a standard. But then when you dig in deeper, you're like, okay, wow, Matt's into music or he's into really passionately talking about his students and helping them at a deeper level than most tutors would do. I mean, it's a blanket statement, but I don't know of anybody who who does what you do <laughs> yeah I, d I yeah. don't know whether yeah I don't know whether it's a culture at um, our university to be honest because I sort of I look around at my colleagues and I see people that are sort of just as passionate just as um, probably more hardworking than me but um, uh, I, I don't know really I think um, I think there's a bit of a cultural shift going on in universities in this country anyway um, and I think the universities that are going to be successful in the future are the ones that really take the time to get to know their students and look after them. Um, we see big shifts in sort of the mental health of um, sort of the country and sort of general populations in general and especially with sort of COVID and lockdown I think um, I think we're going to see a big shift towards that style of tutoring to be honest and I think it's a good shift. <laughs> Mm. And on the mm. back of that, actually, tell us about your experience during this pandemic. What is your experience lecturing and and how have you shifted from, you know, not being in a hall full of hundreds of students and not having that interaction to now? Because everybody has their own experiences, right? So what, what has it been like for you during the pandemic? Yeah, I think um, I think you sort of summed it up sort of my feelings on it is it's that interaction which I've really struggled with um because it's as good as the technology is and as good as sort of we've been using Microsoft Teams which has been a really uh, brilliant platform and uh, we sort of we've been as in innovative as we can and try to interact as much as we can with students it's just not the same the sort of being mm. there seeing them reading their body language and and all those things but I think the other thing that I've struggled with is I rely quite heavily on developing trust and rapport with students and I found that to be a real challenge um, and just I think you know just going back to that mental health piece is just I feel I can't monitor or sort of support students as much as I'd sort of like to just because I'm not seeing them as much and you know if they don't turn up to an online lecture um, it's different to them not turning up to a lecture in person and um, 
I do I do really worry about my students and I find myself worrying a lot more about them I think um, yeah sort of less able to help almost mm. not healthy for you though um, yeah not I think that work yeah that worry um as I, I said in a previous conversation with Tulsa um, about um, this time last year I went a bit blind in one eye because I was so stressed um, mm. So I'm sort of type A personality, as sort of people term it. So I, uh, I've actually worked really hard on my stress and sort of meditating and letting things go and really switching off. So actually, ironically, although there's more pressure and I feel more worried, I'm actually better at not allowing that to get into this sort of negative stress spiral. Um, if you get what I mean. <laughs> I do, no, I do. Manage those tools, haven't you? Before they weren't as accessible or routine, and now you've ventured into areas that actually give you some sanity, because I think during a pandemic, when you're put in a situation that you cannot control, what can you control? Your attitude, your perception, your emotions, your feelings, and your attitude, yeah. right? And it's nice that you found tools to help you do that, and then that's going to make you even better as a, tutor because you then you're going to pass that knowledge and information on to your students yeah and I think essentially that's that's what coaching is is it's for me it transcends any kind of context it's not sport it's not business it's not anything like that what coaching is is the ability of an individual to to help others to progress and that progression could be in a sport that progression could be in uh, business and employment, but it, you know, it could be just day to day life, progressing them towards a point where they can find contentment or happiness. Um, so I think that for me has been a big reflection this year is sort of actually how do I coach myself yeah. to, you know, I, I put all my time and energy into these students, but actually if I do that, that, can end up having a detrimental effect because I neglect my own health or whatever but also yep. I'm not modeling the behaviors that I want to see in my students because I want to see them behaving in a healthy way mm -hmm. um, and if they see me acting like this well they're going to pick up on that and behave like that um, which is sort of unhealthy and not not a positive way to act really one of the key things a good leader does is they act in the way that they want others to act. Um, so it's sort of, you get the theory, but then what does that actually look like? And um, that's actually a very complex thing. Um, very complex thing. So it's, it, it's sort of, um, and that's kind of what academia is, is understanding the, what that theory means in practice. And that's certainly what our program's all about. So actually um, this journey that I've been on in the past year, or so is it's been really valuable in that sense as well and sort of providing those embodied experiences as well but i wanted to chat firstly matt about twitter because it's such a huge media outlet amongst so many different um social apps and it and it is known for information gathering for spreading information for like sharing research which i loved about twitter in itself but it's also known for trolls and drumming up a lot of hatred and controversy so much so that people are beginning to block people who don't necessarily agree with their own opinions now what would you do in the scenario where somebody is purposely being a hater or controversial regarding a topic of conversation that is quite close to your heart what what would you do in that circumstance uh, I mean, I haven't got the best emotional control. So sort of part of um, who I am is I, I have ADD. So basically it means I have, um, I get to that point where you, you get sort of emotional about something much quicker than sort of um, somebody who hasn't uh, got ADD. Um, so I'm not the best at keeping cool. So actually Twitter's quite a nice medium because I can actually just not respond and take a moment to let that sort of uh, hormonal response to kind of dissipate but it's an interesting one because it depends where you draw the line between somebody just being mean and just bullying somebody um but somebody just not being able to present their ideas in a constructive way and sort of to take it out um 
as this sort of personal um, insult to you. So I think it's a tough one. Um, I rarely block people on Twitter and I, I do try and um, gather as many different opinions as possible. Um, I think there's certain topics where you, you just have to draw the line, you know, topics that are just um, completely unacceptable, you know, like racism, sexism, um, anything that involves sort of what I would define as bullying. Mm -hmm. um, but that said, I do try to gather as many different opinions as possible, um, even if I know that I'll never agree with them, because that kind of provides me with, the counter arguments so I can go away and think about, okay, are these valid counter arguments or um, are they not? And then once you kind of know what the counter arguments are, you can then counter those arguments more effectively. Um, so that's why I try and not to block where possible. Um, but sometimes, and sometimes I'll see um, something that I disagree with and I won't engage in the conversation. I'll just observe the conversation and I think that's a nice way of kind of because if you engage then that can become that argument and you don't get nuance on Twitter um, and that's one of the issues with it and that's why it goes a bit far sometimes but um, I think observing is quite a good little uh, tactic that I use as well rather than engaging <laughs> like I said I can't control my emotions very well sometimes <laughs> You, you mentioned a, a tweet, basically, and I'm going to read out the tweet for our audience who haven't seen it. And you mentioned that male coaches being very confident in delivering a poor session and the female coaches who lack confidence but delivering a brilliant session, we used honest, formative feedback throughout our practicals to challenge the assumptions that our coaches have and that you personally amplify voices and set expectations out early, always learning and becoming better and creating a positive learning environment. So my question is, so how do you go about doing this in your environment for your students? And what are your students' interpretation of the success in this culture? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I think it's important to sort of highlight that I'm sort of a white middle class male living in a country where it's very easy to be of my demographic. Um, so what I mean by that is I don't, I haven't experienced any of um, some of the maybe issues and barriers that other people have faced. And um, it's, it's hard for me then to, um, make assumptions about what other people are experiencing so that's where I talk about why I sort of spoke about trying to amplify voices so rather than say maybe how I perceive something to be um, I will observe but I'll try and get other people's perspectives on things and um, amplify what they're saying rather than interpret what they're saying saying and give my own interpretation of it so what that might look like in um, in a practical, I remember when I sort of first started in my uh, role at Hartbury was um, we had one student who um, who's actually now doing a master's in, was pretty much our top student. But in her first year, she was delivering a uh, practical session. And one of the big rugby lads said, um, she's not not bad for a woman and she's pretty fit as well within earshot of me now I'm sure nobody would let that go mm. but I properly just called him out in front of everybody and I called him out because he was actually one of our weaker weaker coaches um, and he would confidently deliver a rugby session that he'd been delivered to probably a hundred times and think he was God's gift so I'd call it out I called him out and I said, you realise that um, this person is a much better coach than you at the moment and is actually able to learn. You've just delivered what you've had delivered, but called it out in front of everybody. Um, and I think for me, it's that's how you embed a culture. You extinguish the behaviours that you think are unacceptable. And that's how you create a positive learning environment and an inclusive learning environment. You don't 
you act when you see um, you see those behaviours and you you act to extinguish those behaviours. Um, so again, another example is, and that example comes from this year, and it was a reflection that myself and my colleague uh, Martin had. So Martin's also sort of this white middle class football coach, um, and just you know absolutely brilliant at his job. But you know we don't have these experiences. But sort of Martin just comes over to me and he goes, "These lads are so confident delivering this session, which is actually crap." And <laughs> And I was like, and it's funny because the girls in that group over there are delivering a brilliant session and we're having this reflection after and they're picking every single fault possible from it. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, you then talk to that and they're like, yeah, it went all right. <laughs> and it was just sort of this anecdotal <laughs> observation. Yeah, this anecdotal observation we, that we observed. And it's like, I wonder if that's the theme. And sort of now we've sort of seen it. You can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. um, so that then affects our approach because then we're then providing the positive feedback to the sort of the female coaches, which we sort of observed are sort of very hard on themselves. And then we're probably providing a bit more constructive feedback to the lads that think, yeah, it's all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That is well. laughs> yeah. Heartwarming to see you guys notice that see that i would say it's a female trait though to mm -hmm. uh not back yourself or talk yourself up at all mm -hmm. it's definitely an australian thing to uh apologize and nitpick yourself would you say it's a british thing as well to not i mean americans are very you know gung-ho and they'll back themselves a, lo a whole lot more than Australians will Canadians as well what about Brits yeah I think if you're talking generally about cultures then yeah absolutely the mm. British love apologizing um you'll have, <laughs> you'll have somebody walk into you in the street and you'll say sorry to them yeah. um uh, so it's just a British culture um yeah but I just it's you know it's an interesting thing because I think for me it's not you know, I wouldn't say all female coaches are like that and all male coaches are like that because we've got mm. loads of the lads which will be exactly the same and sort of pick out every fault they've got. But I think it's, you know, it's, I think there's a cultural underpinning to a, that attitude that kind of is yeah. actively, actively sort of changing and sort of fighting against um, almost. It's sort of that empowerment of... Um, of those coaches if you get what I mean yeah no and I totally agree absolutely agree do that there's that cultural underpinning you know making it even harder mm. as a, a female or someone who's not a white male mm -hmm. white middle class male you know yeah 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 almost then, apologize I mean Matt when you talk about having male and female coaches obviously your feedback is different so you would like mm. to constructive feedback for the males and um probably a little bit more analytical for what the females are already giving you females are probably mm. already being analytical and overly um precise regarding their feedback but does that then give you the chance to create an environment that they do feel nurtured and they do feel confident in that like how is that possible is that possible i think yeah and i think that comes from encouraging this level of vulnerability so vulnerability is something uh bren brown's obviously um done some brilliant talks and um uh written extensively about it and the importance of it um and that's something that sort of i try and create a culture of creating a culture and an environment where it feels comfortable or as comfortable as possible to be vulnerable. Um, so mm. for me, again, I model that, you know, I will talk about my mistakes. I will talk about my experiences. Um, you know, if I make a mistake when I'm talking, um, which I always do, um, I flood my words all the time. I say stupid things. I'll be very open and honest when I do it to try and model that. But also, um, that's about knowing your students and about knowing how far you can kind of push them in terms of becoming uncomfortable and becoming vulnerable because you'll have student a that's very comfortable at kind of having the piss taken out of them you know 
sort of if they make a little mistake, you can pick up on it. Whereas you've got student two, you know, if you picked up on that tiny little mistake that they've made um, in front of others, they'd be mortified. So, um, you know, you've got to take a more maybe measured approach. and Maybe you just one on one kind of go, that was funny, that mistake. Uh, but I won't mention it in front of others, um, if you get what I mean. So, again, the general theme is sort of the female coaches are probably more inclined to not want the piss to be taken out of them in front of everybody. Um, but um, I think it's it's an individual basis with that. So that's sort of some of the approaches I take, but also it's just that reassurance that, you know, look, this is the space to make mistakes. This is the space to try something new. Um, this is the space um, where it doesn't matter because you're coaching with your peers. You're um, There's no effects long-term effects of coaching a rubbish session here you know the whole point of this is to try something and be creative um so it's sort of a mixture of all of those things yeah and and that will reflect back on their coaching as well so if they're coaching athletes or children or elder population is you're still getting to know them as individuals and what makes mm. them work and how your coaching um tools would affect them so it's almost like mm. you pull something out if they know that they're quite vulnerable and and quite sensitive to that issue and it's the same with coaches so you're just basically saying i'm doing what would then in turn give them tools when they're coaching other populations is that correct yeah absolutely and it's it's again it's based on this idea of trust so they need to be able to trust um me because i'm sort of the architect of that environment and that's what a good coach does you know they create this bond with their uh, participants the people that they're working with and they develop that level of trust so if your athletes if your participants don't trust you they're not going to do what you ask and we see it in, you know, on, on match of the day um, or, you know, football analysis, you know, or rugby analysis or whatever, when they say, oh, the coach has lost the dressing room. All that means is the players no longer trust the coach. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's about developing that trust. And that's that's what that environment that enables them to be vulnerable in yeah. is you're putting them in an environment where they trust that they won't be hurt um within that environment psychologically in this case have you seen any differences in what you how you were coaching cal in the elder population or with your athletes is that a similar approach you would take uh yeah absolutely you i think trust is the first thing you have to uh, way beyond knowledge especially in that population um where people are very vulnerable because they're, oh, you know, so many, I work a a lot of rehab, Matt, and people who will turn up um, are being very honest about their mental state as well as their physical state because they're often meshed, right? And so the tears flow and, so that you know, they're showing their vulnerability and you actually have to get them to, well, they, but they trust you at first to even let themselves be so vulnerable with you, but you've just got to know how to handle that situation without them feeling mm-hmm. foolish and without them, you know, pulling back because letting it out is part of the process of healing mm-hmm. physically and mentally. So, yeah, I think trust, um, learning to get someone's trust and then being able to very gently lay your knowledge on top of that uh, is incredibly important but with sports people as well I mean they're yeah. just as vulnerable and just as um, you know liable to not they you know they act so there's a lot of bravado in sport and sportsmen yeah. and um, the the layer underneath that it's a very very thin layer on top of that bravado but very very close underneath yeah there's a ton of vulnerability I love Matt's answer. What we're talking about is getting deeper into a relationship. And Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, you seem like a quite a sympathetic and empathetic person. And there are certain coaches who kind of tap into that skill quite well. So do you ever take, and this is probably a question for both Matt and Kelly, 
do you ever take stuff within you and when you're sympathizing with somebody or listening to them and understanding their situation does it end up being a little bit of a burden to you like it's it's quite a heavy load so do you have tools like this do you actually take it on board because I know I used to quite a lot and then how do you cope with letting that go when it isn't really your burden to carry yeah I think I think that is a really important um a really important point and I think in the past I've been really poor at that you know I take on these burdens I take on these issues as if they're my own um and that's that's had quite a toll so you know this time last year when I had my um eye condition and you know I that was a wake-up call for me I was like I need to find a coping strategy and a skill to deal with this Um, and that's all it is it's a skill Um, and that's how we need to think of everything Um, and it's sort of it's one thing that I um, underpins sort of my understanding of knowledge and sort of um, the way we learn and everything is that pretty much you can learn anything with enough hard work and dedication psychologically pretty much you can learn anything Um, and um, you know that sort of this nature nurture debate to an extent but pretty much you can learn anything um so you can unlearn stuff and relearn stuff and that's that growth mindset stuff from carol dweck although it's a bit more complicated than that um so i think yeah you're absolutely spot on in terms of yeah we can empathize we can share the load we can listen but that's when you need to know where are the limits of my capabilities and my role so where are those limits where do i draw the line it's like okay the students come to me with this and that needs help and that needs support where do i get that support because i'm not a counselor you know i'm not i do not have those skills you know i'm not a mental health nurse um so it's about for me signposting them to the right person to get that support that they need where it sits outside because I'd, I'd love nothing more than to be able to sit down with a student for two hours and counsel them and sort out their issues but a I can't because I don't have those skills uh, but also b that's that's not my job and that's mm. that's um that's not something I can do so it's it's that balance isn't it so I, I don't know how you how you got sort of over that (laughs) just loading of burden onto yourself that's what I do yeah I same thing used to take it all on and it did affect me I ended up with glandular fever so that's how it affected me um and twice that happened to me um and so you know mental burden manifested physically in me and just it drained me of energy and so I you always learn to refer on, but people get very comfortable, especially doing rehabs. They, you are their person. You, they, you are the one they trust and they cling to and they tell things to. And you've got to find, or I had to find a way to uh, find a team around me that I trusted as well as I could tell them that I absolutely trust this person for you to put your faith and, and vulnerabilities into their hands because they are the ones who can actually help you with this. But before I had that team of people that meant something to me, um, Mm. and if I just referred to, oh, I've heard this person is good, they'd go, I don't want anything to do with that person you've heard is good. I want to go to the person that you know is good and that you trust and that you would go to yourself. So for me, building that team around me um, was my saviour. Yeah, and I can completely agree and sort of uh, my brain's whirring so I'm thinking that's exactly you know we have a well-being department and you know again um one thing I do is I go to them I talk to them to get to Mm. know them to build that Mm -hmm. rapport and trust with them and like you said people trust in us and they trust us to direct them to the people that we trust and yes. that tr- it's almost like a train of trust isn't it um, yes yeah i love that idea 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Train of trust. Yeah. I do love that too. Yeah. You can write that one down and, and <laughs> hashtag it. Yeah. yeah. Copyright that. <laughs> Copyright it. That's it. That's the word. Trademark it. Yeah. That's fantastic. I love those answers. And actually, yeah, being in this conversation and just being vulnerable about being vulnerable it's such an important topic of conversation because as an, as an S&C coach, as a lecturer, as anything, you've, you've got so many hats and so many roles to kind of take upon and responsibilities. People often forget that side of things. And then really, isn't that something that is a basic foundation that should underpin all relationships? Mm. Yeah, and, and that, again, is, is something that sort of core to um effective coaching in 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 my opinion is that coaching is about relationships Mm -hmm. and um those sort of coach athlete relationships but also um you know high performing teams as sort of my colleague tom would term it um they all rely on a strong professional uh relationship between all the sort of constituent parts almost the 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 people around you isn't it Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's something I had to learn too as a younger coach uh, is to build a relationship with, uh, say, the physio and the, the medics. Yeah, you know, you, you work so much better hand in hand than you do as an individual mm. member of the team. So, uh, yeah, that, it, I mean, it didn't take me long to work that out, but it's certainly not something that I learned at uni and I should have. Mm. I think it should have been, you know, yeah. It should be a unit in building colleague relationships, you know, not to mm. not to create that friction within the team. Yeah. Because about, yeah. I was just going to say, we now do. <laughs> we are two. Do? First and second year modules are based on interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary working. And um, the first assessment all our students do is on team formation. Wow. Um, yes. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Obviously, the coaches are better than the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's yeah. really, it's so rare to see, isn't it? It's so rare to mm-hmm. have this program because all of us have come through the coaching field where we've learned those things and it's very hard to kind of know that that should have been underpinning in our knowledge right from the start. And every job that we've gotten into in that, that beginning phase, though, that was the key relationship building isn't it mm. the other professionals that we don't need to step on other people's toes or step over them we can right mm. yeah oh everything runs so sp- more smoothly more like clockwork when when you do don't you and I think one thing that really cemented it to me was um I got feedback from the cricket coach when I left cricket and one of the things she wrote down was that when Kelly was part of the team, things ran smoothly, like there was no, yeah, and I thought, lovely, lovely thing to say, lovely thing to hear, but it also made me realise that taking that quality deliberately, not, you know, just it actually happened because we all got along so well, but deliberately trying to build those relationships the way Matt does into the next one has, you know, has worked again, but it's a very deliberate thing by me this time round. Yeah, and and that's sort of again something we try to instill in all our coaches is you need to be purposeful with everything you do. So everything you do needs to have a purpose. So sometimes, um, um, you know, one of the one of the reflections I always talk about it's like sometimes you might think that I'm just, you know, having a laugh, you know, just telling crap jokes, and you know, it might come across as sort of like this is a lecturer just sort of sat there just sat on the table having a chat telling a few jokes and stuff and you might just think you know that's just who he is that's just something that he does but actually if we reflect on it it's very purposeful because it's making you feel comfortable it's creating a Mm -hmm. connection between ourselves it's actually very purposeful teaching and coaching um and i for me it's sort of that's the kind of level of understanding of your own practice that you're going to be developing throughout your degree program is you're developing an understanding of why you do the things you do. And if you can't justify something you do, don't do it. 
because there's no no point to it but like you were saying kelly you then sort of had that light bulb moment it's sort of like this isn't just me being me this is me being a brilliant coach and this is a brilliant skill and this is something i can use to actually sell myself because mm. you know this is something i'm good at and i just haven't thought about it just because it kind of comes natural to me um and that's sort of what we're sort of trying to instill in our students i love your course <laughs> doesn't it sound good tulse i wish i had it honestly i do too yeah I see yeah courses i'm like that that's the one for me that's what we should have started with your students are really lucky they really are yeah yeah, yeah. I get, we're at a point where this is now published research this isn't um you know this isn't just all f just out of my own brain this is stuff that's published and you know people have done brilliant research on so it's um and that's the great thing about academia i, I think there's a lot of things in academia that can be improved but one of the great things is it's just relentless pursuit to improve what we know and how we understand the world mm -hmm. and you know since we did our degrees you know it's it's come on a huge amount um and it's just like how do you just keep on <laughs> uh, adapting to that relentless uh, pursuit of um uh, better knowledge and understanding <laughs> yeah I well, I'm interested to meet some of the coaches that come out of your program, Matt. Won't it be good? And we will see a lot of them, I'm sure, yeah. or hear about a lot of them. <laughs> I think yeah. because, I, I don't know about you, Kelly, but because we're not really in the academia field, it's really hard to then understand that it can be quite um, fluid in terms of its practical approach and academic and research-based approach. Sometimes you hear a lot, even on the field, is, oh, we've always done it this way. This is how it's done. So it's really hard to kind of translate how academia does change its course and how is it molding itself to the research that has proven that this actually supports yeah. students' well-being, welfare, and coaching. Yeah, and that's why, again, one of the, the key underpinning um, ideas of sort of our degree program is actually reflection and reflection as a skill nice. and the ability to challenge your own practices assumptions and understandings so that critical analysis of yourself that introspective um skill so um in the first year we we underpin um the the core coaching module with um john cote's work on coaching um expertise and um his sort of uh, and um Wade Gilbert as well, uh, they break it down to sort of these three areas of coach knowledge. So one is the professional knowledge. So your uh, ability to know the sport, the activity, whatever field you're working in, uh, but also your understanding of how to deliver effective coaching, so pedagogy. Um, and then you've got your interpersonal skills, so interactions, relationship building, all of those things that we've talked about, but then your uh, intrapersonal skills. So your ability to reflect, your ability to um, maybe be vulnerable with yourself, which is a yeah. very difficult skill, very, very difficult skill. Um, and sort of your ability to continue to challenge your assumptions and understandings to develop and to continue to develop. Um, and that's sort of the underpinning of the first year, but is a theme that continues um throughout the program and it's a theme that you see being embedded into more coach education um uh moving forwards uh, as well which is great yeah sure is so when you say um being vulnerable with yourself is a hard skill absolutely agree yeah. um and to keep challenging why you think things does this go back to even the way you were raised in the environment you were raised in and the, the news you read and what happened around you at the time? Or is it more like uh, what's happening in my immediate surroundings that is making me agree with this or think this? Because it can sometimes, for me, go all the way back to the way I was brought up as a child. Some yeah. biases. Yeah, I think, yeah, and I... <sighs> I don't know really that's a that's a really tough question yeah yeah because yeah. Uh, I think for me um and something I, I I'm quite passionate about inclusion 
Um, and I, I, I basically, my mind was opened by a module, a couple of modules I did in my undergraduate degree program on inclusion and just sort of um, looking at how society disables people and the barriers that society and other people's attitudes, etc., put up to people, um, which opened my mind to it. But part of inclusion and one of the key things I've sort of found out about inclusion is there's all kinds of biases that influence our assumptions about the world. So uh, sort of confirmation bias, um, affinity bias, which I sort of read and it blew my mind. And it's like, wow, we naturally kind of um, sort of lean towards people that we think look like us, sort of physically, physically. Mm-hmm mentally emotionally so we we create a stronger bond with these people naturally and actually it takes a conscious effort to kind of counteract that bias so I think um I think yeah you're you're spot on our our early life experiences have a massive impact but how do you appreciate them and become aware of them that that's where I think the difficulty is and the difficulty lies Mm. Mm. yeah it's a whole nother degree isn't it yeah. I think that's a whole new conversation. That's so interesting, isn't it? And mm. I think you handled that answer quite quite well. I was super oh, I do, I was, do. oh my goodness, how is he gonna answer that? That's a really that was a good question. I like it. Just say some long words. That's that's the academic way of getting out of a yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, there you go. Well done. Well Matt, done. I wanted to ask a little bit. Going back to an earlier conversation that we were having was about missing the interaction. We've talked about being vulnerable. We've talked about trust with our um, coaches, with our athletes. And being in this pandemic, being in an environment where you have to deliver your lectures in a solitude environment, some of your students might not even have the video on and and you miss that level of interaction. We all know that that is a big part of coaching, but as somebody who is a supportive and caring tutor, how do you first manage this within your own environment? But, but how do you access tools to manage your, to help support your students in this environment as well? Yeah, I I think that's the ultimate question at the moment. Um, you know, it's it's the one that sort of is is constantly in the back of my mind is how do I maintain um, what I believe makes my approach effective? Um, and um, I think that's just to answer the solitude and the, the sort of the environment. You know, I, I sit at home by myself effectively all day, but... Um, I've developed quite good coping strategies for that. So we have our work WhatsApp groups, you know, I'll, I'll reach out to students, you know, I send them emails or maybe arrange a drop in, um, you know, I have quite a lot of tutorials throughout a day or throughout a week. So, um, you know, I still get quite a lot of interaction, albeit digitally. Um, so I think it's that balance one-on-one interaction students pretty much always turn on their uh, cameras, mm-hmm. anything more than three or four, they won't bother. They won't do it. And I do not blame them at all. I, you know, they're in bedrooms that, you know, they're in random spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's an invasion of privacy, you yeah. know, that having a camera on is an invasion of a personal space and that has um, ramifications uh, for people. So I've got no issue with that. Um, so I think it's, again, it comes down to that kind of, um, that kind of trust and it's kind of a different kind of trust, but I'm trusting that the students will come to me if if they do have any significant issues, if there's anything that they need help with. And I feel like we were lucky that we got the beginning of the term and the semester in person to develop that rapport and trust. Um, so I think it's it's a time for me to trust them almost to be mature enough to come to me. And, you know, students do. Um, but it's uh, it, it, it does worry me sometimes that we don't have as much access um, to them as, as, as maybe we're used to. But um, I just think it, 
we can't control it we can do the best we can and we can continue to learn from it but um at the end of the day you have to let go of things that you can't control and that's sort of how i manage with sort of my worry and doubt in the situation I'm not sure if that even answered the question but that's, <laughs> that's the journey answers. It's, it's, <laughs> i think it just epitomized everything that you stand for and how yeah. you actually reach out for your students and build up that relationship that they can actually trust you that answer was just I loved it. It was beautiful. I know. So I feel like I've developed a level of rapport and trust with Matt in this yeah. last hour, <laughs> right? And I would go to you with my problems, but I don't want to add anything to your worry. I think you've just got to throw some of your worries away because they're kind of irrelevant. Everything you've told me, I go, you are a superhuman and what a great coach and they are so lucky to have you. But we're going to dive into a little bit of a, a quick fire or our quick fires now. And the first okay. one is twofold, okay? If there was another role besides coaching, coaching and tutoring, caveat, and money wasn't an issue, what would you want to do and why? I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> the, the, one, the one that immediately springs to mind is, is nursing, um, yes. to be honest. Wouldn't you be good uh, at it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. My mum's my an ex-nurse, so uh, yeah. and my, da my dad's an OT, so I've got Yeah, so it's in the, the family. family. It's in the blood. Yeah. 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 I think you'd be an excellent nurse. Mm. I, and I in just, some ways, I think you'd do that anyway. I, it's, such a, it's such a noble profession. Um, a little bit squeamish, but I'll get over that. Oh, yeah. A nurse without the blood part of it? And the needles? <laughs> yeah, to be honest, I fainted once taking my own, um, <laughs> taking my own blood. So. <laughs> <laughs> Were you by yourself? <laughs> Uh, I was, and I just forgot to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Why were you taking your own blood, like as a blood test or like a, a finger prick? Finger prick, and you finger passed prick. out? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, just couldn't, I just couldn't press the button. I was just, you know, the little <laughs> auto-injector things. I just couldn't, I just, I just stood staring at my finger, thumb on the auto <laughs> Uh, injector and I just <laughs> forgot to breathe and I just sort of slid down the chair onto my back and I was just like I should probably never tell anyone about this and now I've just told it to everyone <laughs> no, on the podcast, you told everyone. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go there's a lessening vulnerability I got I over that. it though I got over it because I managed to do another one later down the line so it's all oh right. brilliant yeah good work well done <laughs> I love that good answer, and you would be a good nurse despite the not taking your own blood. Yeah, good on. Oh, and um, mm -hmm. another quick fire for you: What books and podcasts are you currently following? Tell us what what's behind the brain of Matt. Well, I've got these are the books I'm reading at the moment. So I've got lots of I've got <laughs> mountain biking books. So yes. those listening on the podcast, I'm reaching up to a um, a shelf just above my head. Um, and then there's two two sort of books I'm reading at the moment. One's called Other People's Children, um, and this is about understanding um, cultural conflict in a, in the classroom. So I've only just started reading that one, um, but that's to give me sort of a better understanding of sort of how cultural differences impact sort of teaching and learning um as well and then um one of my favorite books that i've ever read is nudge um which is about sort of um how to basically influence behaviors and using sort of this political approach um david cameron was a, a big advocate of it it to influence sort of uh, people's behaviors so i'm just reading one of the following ones which is the ethics of influence um so it's sort of looking at the ethical side of governments influencing people uh, through nudge tactics hey. interesting and heavy reading yeah but what always does interest me because i read a lot of uh books like that as well but mm. do you read any fiction Every single night, I'll read Terry Good Pratchett. Uh, yeah. so I love Terry Pratchett because it just, it's how I get to sleep. And I manage to read about one page a night. So it takes me months to finish what is essentially <laughs> so a children's it's boring? book. No, it's just, I just it's find just, it's the most relaxing thing because I absolutely love it. Um, yes. But then when it comes to podcasts, I don't actually listen to many work 
based podcasts I try to listen to entertainment podcasts because that's when I sort of uh, unwind so obviously I'm listening to unapologetically you oh, I managed to say it um, which is great because sort of that's that's the podcast that's on in my bike workshop because I love my bikes uh, yes. but I listen to um, fighting talk and sort of radio Four comedies yeah. um, Scott Mills I absolutely love Scott Mills um, he's a sort of British uh, radio DJ um, okay. so sort of all stuff like that okay what are you listening to Toss? oh all sorts well when Matt yeah. was talking about um Terry Pratchett I love I still like reading about business and mindfulness and spirituality philosophy but I'm also into podcasts which are more about cognitive um, function. So female brains, what's behind female brains? How is it affecting their um, physiology, their biology, their genes? So I'm really into that at the moment. And then there's the other side of me who which loves space. So I, I want to... Oh, she's a space nerd, Matt. Yeah, space yeah. podcast and I'm watching Universe on Netflix. And yeah, I love it all. <laughs> Big Brian Cox fan. Yeah, he does a great podcast called um, The Infinite Monkey Cage on Radio 4, oh, cool. which is it's not space based, but it's sort of comedy mixed with science, yeah. which is really good. Really comedy mixed with science. I like that. Yeah. Well, seeing that Neil deGrasse Tyson has um, Star Talk and, on his podcast and he is hilarious. So that's what my brother got me into. I, I swear, ever since I was little, my brother's always influenced me and it's not changed as an adult. <laughs> listen to this radio and read this book. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love it. Uh, okay. What is your biggest strength? Um, I like to think I, I'm quite good at building uh, relationships very quickly. I always sort of Agree. reflect. Okay. That's probably my biggest strength. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. And how do you purposefully cultivate this? Um, I think, like I've sort of said throughout the podcast, I, I just try and provide as authentic um, a version of myself as possible. And actually, it's it's helped me back quite a lot, that presentation of an authentic self, because sometimes it kind of gets up and maybe sometimes crosses that line of professionalism. Um, but I think it's that presentation of authentic self, that honest conversation. But I think it's the listening and um, beyond just listening, but actually hearing and processing what sort of other people are saying. Mm. That empathy. Mm. I love that. Uh, now we can uh, talk to you for hours and hours, but yeah. just to round up this podcast, we always ask our guests right at the end if you were to pick one person to be a guest on our podcast and somebody you would like to listen to or uh, hear from, who would that be? Oh, well, I've got a list of about a thousand people that I just I could listen to sort of all day, every day. Um, and I think you two have now joined that list. So well done. Um, um, I've got a colleague called uh, Dean Clark and he's a coach educator and an XP teacher. And he when he talks, he's one of those people that sort of you can hear a pin drop. You know, he's just the most mm. fascinating, um, fascinating person. And he's one of these people that just sits and listens and processes. Um, and then, bam, there's just this incredible insight that just comes out of nowhere. And you just sort of like, wow. <laughs> okay. Dean sounds like yeah. someone I'd like to listen to as well. Yeah. All right. Well, did you write that down, Tulse? Dean Clark? Yeah. Good girl. Yeah, I didn't even need to ask. She's <laughs> on it. Yeah. Well, Matt, you, you have certainly proven that you walk your talk. Absolutely. So um, everything you told us, you proved within an hour. I, I, it's so impressive. And such an impressive person and such an impressive coach. And you're going to build a new generation of impressive coaches as well. So congratulations to you as well for all the work you do and I don't think you need to worry as much about anything as you do you're doing a magic job with the people that you work with yeah. thank you very much 
And I'm so glad you were able to come on this podcast and reveal the insights to who you truly are and then give our guests that amazing insight into you and how extraordinary you actually are in what you do and and your values and beliefs and morals like yeah you are true to your word and it's just been such a pleasure to speak to you hasn't it just yeah thank you very much yeah. and likewise I, like i said I'm, I'm listening to the podcast and i just love how um how you present the authentic views and it just bounces and it draws out um that rapport you have draws out the um the interesting things from these people that you're you're talking to so uh, it's it's reciprocal thank you